edition of Wake and Bake News, and I'm your host, Shampoo VTA, very far away. And how are you on this Monday, Kelly Davis? <laughs> Just threw that in, Kelly Davis. I forgot the ending. Okay, so we're going to uh, try something here. I'm going to, because I found out this Keith has, key, I mean, this this shake has Keith in it. This shake has Keith in it, because I Keefed it. You notice how little I have now? Because I started keeping it, and I was like, ooh, yeah, cool. <laughs> So let's go keep this and see what happens. Okay, so I put a game token in mine, put it in the freezer, right? And then the game token inside, you know, like the token like to go to the bathroom or a quarter or something like that. But this is from an arcade. Uh, bangs around in there and helps knock the key off, right? So now you got to beat the hell out of it. Because you're trying to loosen up all that frozen key that's releasing itself from the plant matter. And knock it down it through the screen. If you have a three-piece grinder, I think this is three-piece or whatever four-piece grinder like this, and that way it'll make that happen for you. So you can hear that. I like to give it a real good bang. Bang for the buck. There's something banging against. Piece of wood's always good. You don't have to do it hard, just a little bit shockingly, a little bit jarringly, you know? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so let's see what happens. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. Ooh. Hmm. See what you think. kind of a mix. No, I mean, that's key. Before I was getting like uh, chunks of dried leaf and you could tell the difference between that because that's so, it's not sticky. It blows away. The keef is sticky. See how it pulled away all in one kind of chunk like that? Keef is a little more sticky. Yeah, that's right, Gene. You spill it on the floor. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> So now I take some of this yucky trim that I got the key from, and that's just going to be like a unpleasant, because I don't have buds, something to put, to, to you know, like a screen. It's, it's going to keep the key on top and be material to smoke too, but it's going to keep the key from just slipping right down into the hole and being gone forever. And we're just going to put that key on top of this stuff that I haven't keefed doo, 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 doo. and I use a guitar pick to get it out of this thing you know I just use a nice thin guitar pick that works great to scoop things up and scrape it around so this is what it looks like all keefed with that shitty fucking shake but um, like I was telling my brothers notice that when I first start taking leaves it sucks I mean it's gross it's not even worth it so I started, like, if I'm desperate, I'll smoke that. But, and you've seen me desperate. <laughs> but for the most part, you know, it sucks. But it is great for making lotion. It's great for putting in your food. It's not going to get you high, and you're still getting all whatever else is in the plant, which I can't believe is bad for you. It's a plant, so it must be good. So, But later, as you get all those, you know, your big leaves knocked down and... Um, the smaller leaves are coming out of the buds. Those become sugar leaves. And the guy that uh, I learned this from, he said, don't let the leaves grow four inches out from the plant. T take those and keep them short and, and scrubby, you know, like a, like a fucking bristle brush, you know, like a like bottle brush or something like that. Because if too many leaves, it'll put a lot of energy into the leaves. Now, other people don't believe this is a good thing. They believe leave the, the great big leaves on. But I think I've had really good experience, and, and manicuring the leaves helps to form the buds better instead of, you know. But I, I've only been growing for a couple years. You know, I, I've always wanted to, never could. Tried many times during Prohibition to hide it. Like in a, one time, I fucking put a hole in the, and a tile in the kitchen, not here, but in another apartment, 
right? They had one of those, like a, um, a closet. So you could put your canned goods and stuff and it went from the floor up. And then there was another little cabinet and then the ceiling. So I knocked out the bottom of the cabinet, put a ladder so you could crawl up into the ceiling. So you would go into the cupboard and use the cupboard as your, as your way up in the ceiling. And then I was trying to grow up there in the ceiling and no, that just, <laughs> I just never could get it done. So I'm not like an expert on this. I've learned over many mistakes and trial and error and stuff. So I'm still learning. But I find that the trimming the leaves thing does help. And plus you get to enjoy the leaves and stuff while you're waiting for those buds to form, you know. And I've had pretty good bud forming. I don't know how these plants are going to come out. But nice plants, because these are mystery wheat that I have. But nice plants came out. Nice, you know. Jumbo, by the way. <laughs> Jumbo. We had a card party, okay? I want you to look at this. We had a card party. And I were I was I let people taste the jumbo, right? Couple hits for everybody. I don't know if you can see that. I think I have to get a flashlight. And I I bought this like what last week, the week before, something like that. So let's take a look at how much is left. That's like half. I've only used like half, I mean, the bottle, you know, I mean, a little over half, maybe. But there is still a ton of this stuff left. Jumbo. I'm like, holy crap, this is great. <laughs> and I think it's great because, you know, like you don't have to smoke pot the whole time. You hit a, have a couple of hits of Jumbo and you can't have too much because... It's got this uh, peppermint in it, and it'll kind of make your tummy turn if you are like have like a ton of peppermint. I don't see you could drink that whole thing, because I think the peppermint oil might get to you a little bit. But And peppermint's supposed to sell your tummy. But I, th I would think that it would be like eating too much peppermint candy. You kind of not feel too good. After <laughs> so I think having it peppermint is really cool, because it's like a breath freshener. It's like banaca, and put it down. Then maybe a couple of minutes later, take another couple of hits and put it down. And it lasts a really long time. And I was thinking if you got that 500 uh, milligram bottle for like uh, 80 bucks, I bet you that thing would last you forever. You know, I mean, and, like I was talking to um, my family about it and they were like, I pour it in my water, or my drink or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> get that little extra minty flavor to your cocktail. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> you could do that, you know. Cheers. So while I was waiting for this to keep, oh, that tastes good. Much better. Much better. Okay. And uh, I dried out this stuff so much, I don't think this would... Um, I don't think this would do very much for me as, uh, you know, rosin tech. It's not super crystally and wet. Like, I, I have some seeds for some other buds from Canada that I may plant after the election and stuff when I know things are more safe. <laughs> right now, we're really kind of expecting the police to go crazy a little bit in California. Um, we're seeing how things work out. But... Everybody's kind of expecting the police to kind of go a little bit off the rails because they're, you know, you're you're taking away one of their major resources and what used to be their way for investigating and, and leveraging crime, you know, which means that they come and investigate you for something. Oh, you smell like pot. And now I'll just search through all your stuff until I find something to bust you for, you know. Well, now the Supreme Court apparently has completely allowed that. The, and Sotomayor so blew up. And I don't blame her because it was basically saying that people could do an illegal search and still hand in evidence uh, that they found an illegal search and you could still be prosecuted for it. Which now means that the police can pull over anybody they want and stop you in the street like fucking Nazis and go, show me your papers. Do you have your papers? Where are your papers? You know, that's fascism. So, uh, but on the other hand, I'm kind of a person that has learned from the drug war that 
when you allow these idiots to go ahead and flourish when they're crippled and criminal and corrupt, it ends their shit a lot sooner. That the police would have been able to keep the drug war going longer if they hadn't start dipping into the white communities and going after white kids and white college kids and, and big football players and stuff like that. The minute that the drug war started to expand past its original racist intentions, people started to get upset about it. And that was the beginning of the end, but that was a, a pretty long process, like 30 years. Well, if you give the police, the uh, here they have, they're already partially or a lot corrupt. They're after people's property. They're after people's money. They're a starving man on the street with a knife and they're willing to rob anybody. Okay. So uh, they want these tools so they can rob people, give it to them. It'll end the shit faster. It'll be horrible for the poor communities and for uh, people of race. But in the end, it'll never fucking happen again because they'll end it fucking quick. You watch. What did I say? Uh, uh, I Claudius. Claudius says, let all the poisons in the mud come out, right? Because he knew that him helping Rome was not helping, that this was too corrupt and had to die. As much as he loved it, wanted to see it continue on. And in many ways it has. And it's much, and it's, it's had much better iterations of itself than because much of our, our uh, politics and our entire civilization is based on what the Romans and Greeks created. Even though they're long gone, we've taken what's uh, as best as we can from the old Republic and uh, left all that Caesar, I'm a God bullshit and bread fucking idiot family behind and dumped that crap because that was stupid and crazy, you know. So just like this, I, it's a horrible thing. But in the end, I'll bet you it's going to end this shit a lot faster. I bet you it's get because it's going to get out of control and it'll end this shit a lot faster. You almost have to burn the fever out of the body, you know, and it will be horrible. But we'll get the numbers and we'll get the demographics and we'll get the charts to prove what's happening. And then that will be the end of civilian police forces as we have known them. I don't know what's going to come, but you can feel it like you do with the teachers. They took the teaching profession and now you're afraid every teacher's going to feed your kids semen on a spoon or rape them or molest them or have sex with them or something. You know, you know, you just, you just, from all the news and everything, uh, they have done a very successful job in destroying the teacher's ability to have respect from the community because the teachers used to be rock stars. In the 80s and 90s, teachers were untouchable rock stars. Their unions were powerful. And slowly but surely, the newspapers and the political system ripped them a new one. And they are, unions in general, are much less powerful than they used to be. And the police are on the menu. They're at the top of the menu. They're the main course. They've got the biggest paychecks. They get all those fun toys. The military's giving them toys. Somebody wants what they have and they're coming after it. And, and the police have been, in my opinion, stupid. Stupid, blind, and self-destructive in allowing uh, and not using their unions to fight poor training and things that brought this nightmare on them. They brought it on themselves because they did not, they saw it happening, they knew it wasn't good, but they were so butthurt and felt so special and so, you know, a small group amongst themselves that they just, they're not going to pull their heads out of their ass before somebody comes along with Robocop or something to replace them. And it's coming. It's going to be a drone. It's going to cost you five cents. It's going to fly around the neighborhood. There's a kid in my backyard. You know, another drone's coming. They don't even have to bust the kid. Kid comes home. There's already a paddy waggy waiting for him. Get in the bed. Okay, time to go. And they're not even going to chase him in the future. It, it's going to be so difficult to commit crimes in a super surveillance system. 
that what and especially when look at what they're doing they're trying to increase surveillance by allowing you to be able to go after normal people on the street based on whatever it is that you come up with or lie about or whatever and it'll be fine because if it turns out to be a bad guy it's like winning the lottery it's like oh you won ding 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 how many cops are gonna get burned trying to win and they're all gonna try to win it's a setup it's another setup why would you give them so much power if you weren't setting them up? Because it's not good for them. It's like, hey, you know, corn flour, sugar, sugary flakes is a great part of every healthy breakfast. Of course, it's not the healthy part of that breakfast, but it's a great part of it. <laughs> the government used to tell us that shit, and they were killing our kids and shit, and making everybody obese and everything with their fucking food pyramid and everything. So if the police are trusting, they're nuts. They're crazy. They've gotten themselves into really big trouble, in my opinion. I, everybody I know does not have a very high view of the police right now. And they used to. And that's what really blows me away. There was a neighborhood down the hill that had a whole block party to raise money for the police. That was, gosh, almost 20 years ago. And you don't see that shit today. My advice is the very first thing you should do is get rid of those fucking ridiculous fucking costumes. Oh, the bars and stars and the black uniforms and stuff are so fucking dumb. I can't even tell you. And I don't, I've never understood what the hell black polyester uniforms have to do with southern goddamn 80 degree California. <laughs> I'd like to torture all my men in the police force. Let's see. Uh, let's give them a bat utility belt made of leather that weighs about 35 pounds and put them in a black polyester uniform like they were serving fucking fries at McDonald's in 1978. And then let's place them in the hot, blaring sun and rain and windy conditions and everything on the beach, on a boat in the ocean, in a black polyester uniform with drug dogs. Like, what are you, sniffing for submarines? I mean, I don't know what goes through people's heads. <laughs> okay, that was just my rant. I actually do have some news. And my rant was supposed to go somewhere, but I lost it. <laughs> Because I'm like, oh shit, I got to pay attention to what I'm doing. And I got a couple other things on my mind. I'm working on a toy guitar that I got from the thrift store. These cheap ass toy guitars from Mexico. So I'm trying to fix, I've taken the necks off of several of them and made other guitars and, and like a cigar box guitars and stuff. And whenever I have a project like this, it's literally sitting in the back of my mind. Like in a chair going, are you going to get to me? Yes, I'm trying to think of you, but I have to do this don't forget, you got to drill out the tuners and find out where the drill is. Shh! <laughs> I, I, I just have this because I can think of more than one thing at once. And it's like, I know I have to do that too, but right now I have to pay attention to this. So get, sometimes I like drift because my mind is starting to think about, oh shit. You'll see me screw up, and it's because I'm literally thinking about something in the room is distracting me. The bird, somebody came in the door, I sense something behind me that's bothering me. You know, I, I, it's amazing the things that will distract my mind, you know. Maybe it's part of being a girl or just Kelly, I don't know, or both, who knows. So that didn't really go very far, did it? All right, so I actually do have some stories to talk about today that are very interesting. And did have kind of to do with what it started to rant about. Uh, I have this one about the California largest political party, which is the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party. Let me say that again. The Democratic California Democratic Party has endorsed the uh, uh, Adult Use of Marijuana Act, which is huge, huge. Let me tell you how this is huge, because you're no longer going to be able to tell me that Hillary Clinton, because she hasn't said something, is not going to be for legal marijuana. She cannot win California without making us happy. And you know what makes us happy? 
You know what's on the November ballot? You know what's more popular than most of the politicians running in this election, including her? Marijuana. And if she wants to be our friend, she needs to be Mary Jane's friend. And it isn't like, you know, uh, 2010 with Prop 19, which they, they talk about in here, where everybody was so concerned and I had moms standing around the, in the hallway like morons going, but then more people, more kids will try it if it's legal. If it's legal, more kids will try it. You're a dumbass. You can tell me that you can speak successfully to a student and show them the dangers of alcohol or cigarettes, which are regulated, but some magical way you cannot stop them from smoking marijuana if it was regulated or explaining to them why it would be smart to wait till they were, you know, old enough or whatever. No, this is like beyond you. <laughs> that somehow marijuana has a magical power that none of these other regulated drugs have. So now that that's gone <laughs> and there's no more of that shit, uh, Hillary Clinton and Barbara Boxer, and especially Diane Payne in my ass, I'm pissed off at her Feinstein, had better pull their collective butts out of their collective heads and stop being those dumb, dimbat broads standing in the hallway saying something brainless that they heard off the news, like, but if it's legal, more kids will try it. You even do this for a living. And you know better than that, but you just click right into that because you are a dipwad and programmed, you know. So if these ladies want to prove to me that they are leaders, then they need to start talking like leaders. And leaders are not going to just keep bullshitting their way around something. I can understand a little bit at the beginning. Hillary Clinton is trying to run for president of the United States. But it looks to me like she's got plenty of money. She's got $45,000 million to run this campaign with or whatever. And and uh, Donald Trump has one. 1.5. And he's out in the street with a tin cup begging the Republican Party to save his ass from his own stupidity. Okay. I hope this is going to be Greek and it's tragedy for him. It should be fun to watch. Anyway, I don't see anybody running up to pay the check for him. And somebody's going to have to foot the bill and probably lose it. Because she is also now winning polls in Florida. And she's tied in Ohio. Do you know why? Because Donald Trump walked around and said that he could finance his own campaign. And now he's broke. He's not financing. And he's begging for money. Huh. <laughs> kind of fucks you up when you're a presidential can candidate out there begging for money like a homeless guy. You know, and then you're like, I will not raise, I will do things that are good for business. Like what? Beg for more money? <laughs> and that's out of the way. So this is out of the way. That's out of the way. There's no reason now why Hillary Clinton could not easily come out in favor of regulated, not just medical marijuana, but recreational, because there is no way in hell that you should be able to ban a substance that can not do you any harm, or particularly less harm, far less harm than alcohol and tobacco, which is regulated. And just because those things are dangerous and stupid does not mean that you do not regulate the thing that is less dangerous. That is also an irrational and stupid argument. We're done now. We're done with all that. We're moving on to this. And this means you get on board with this thing and you do it now. There is no more time to wait. The nut, the, oh, the, the door of history has closed on people's nuts and that's it. It's over. Now it's over. It's been over a month since the story came out that the Ninth Circuit told the DEA to fuck off on the West Coast. Another uh, uh, company just fucking got raided and then guess what? Dropped all charges. This is a new day. You better step up to it. I hope I can. I think there's going to be a lot of issues and stuff that I don't even, I mean, I was like, wow, there's all kinds of things I never even thought of. And I've been thinking about this for 30 years. Imagine how behind most of these dipwad fucking politicians are. Okay, so I'm going to read this story to you. Sacramentobee.com.
California's largest political party just endorsed legalizing marijuana. California was the first state to allow medical marijuana. Now, two decades later, voters are expected to be asked whether to legalize recreational recreational use of the drug. The legalization measure headed for the state's uh, November ballot is the product of months of negotiation between draw, uh, drug law enforcement, growers, and distributors, uh, famous financiers, and politicians. Here's a primary. Six years ago, the California Democratic Party joined most of its elected leaders in declining to endorse the marijuana legalization initiative on the fall ballot. In, in arguing for a neutral position, Democratic activists said they were worried an endorsement would harm their leading candidate, Jerry Brown and Barbara Boxer, who were in competitive contests for governor and the U.S. Senate. This year's measure to legalize recreational pot, however, has uh, stirred no similar concerns on Sunday at their executive board meeting in Long Beach Democratic uh, Democrats opted to embrace the pot proposal after hearing from one of the chief supporters, Lieutenant Gavin Newsom, a leading candidate to succeed Brown as governor in 2019. County Democrat, or yeah, County Democrat, Democratic parties blah, 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 in Los Angeles and San Francisco recently afford, offered their own support for. Uh, legitimizing marijuana, joining Democrat Rep. Ted Lieu of Torrance and Jared Hoffman of San Rafael. Campaigning ahead of the state's June 7th primary, Democratic presidential hopeful Bernie Sanders said he would vote in favor of legal cannabis in November if he were a resident of the state. Some party activists, including a representative from the Marijuana Growers Association, had wanted the party to take no position, a point seized on by the opposition campaign. There's a real concern that the pro proponents got it wrong again. Spokesperson Tim Ro Rosa Rosales said Monday. Still, they did not call for the debate on the issue last weekend, and more Democratic support is expected to follow. Bo Boxer, who, like Newsom, opposed the a Proposition 19 legalization measure in 2010, indicated recently that she may come aboard this year, plugging her new book, The Art of Tough, on Real Times with Bill Maher. Boxer said, I'm leaning in favor. There's just one issue that a ser that's a serious one I am looking at, which is worrisome from Colorado and Washington State, where they have seen driver fatalities go up, Boxer said. But there is something in the initiative that does address that. So I am hoping that I'll be able to support it this time. Now, the thing about uh, uh, fatal crashes going up is not science. She's basically, this is like pathetic, actually. Every time they have a fatal crash, uh, they test to see what drugs are, your, are in your system and marijuana stays in your system for a month. So if you have marijuana in your system, uh, obviously it caused the crash, not the alcohol or, you know, the fighting with your kids or yelling at your husband or not paying attention or talking on the cell phone or anything else that might have been going on. Obviously, the marijuana that you ingested a month ago killed you on the road today. And those are the kind of stats she's talking about. And they are going to go up in a puff of logic. All right, so my second story is actually the one from San Francisco Gate that is about this dispensary, or not dispensary, but oil manufacturer that apparently has big time political pull. And it's not an LP, a legal provider like in Canada, backed by the government, which is like the most stupid fucking idea on earth. I cannot believe that Canada is this dip stupid. You never give something that is a sin over to your government. I mean, you know, it's sin taxable over to your government. Are you crazy? Oh, those people are about nothing but greed. You must be crazy.
government weed is just going to turn out like government cheese. Subsidized and not tasting very good. A big nasty block of dried out shitty cheese that you wouldn't even hardly see in a restaurant. So gross. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read this to you. It's amazing. Uh, I just loved hearing it. I knew when I when I saw the stories about this bus, I'm like, well, there's something that's going nowhere. And fast. SanFranciscoGate.com California's marijuana company beats police raid. Now, if you remember recently, there was a raid of a oil manufacturer somewhere up north, which outraged many activists across California, and which I said was sort of looked a little strange because the DEA was standing there playing with their willies and masturbating, watching other police officers do what they wished they could have done. And I thought, hmm, this doesn't have the force of law. This looks like a circle jerk. And it turns out it was. California's newly regulated medical cannabis industry is done running and hiding from police and has started standing its ground. Activists are cheering the newfound political muscle of legal medical marijuana after a major police raid last week resulted in a massive protest and a political and political pressure. Then the release of cannabis business operator with no criminal charges and zero bail. Major California medical cannabis company, Care by Design, has resumed oil making operations in Santa Rosa this week after a disgruntled uh, employee sparked a massive 100 office raid of their commercial extraction operation in Santa Rosa on Wednesday. Police initially arrested Care by Design's operator, Dennis Hunter, on charges of running a meth lab type operation with bail set at five million. But the raid on the uh, prominent professional, well-connected care by design generated an unexpected backlash for police. The following day, hundreds gathered at the Sonoma County Courthouse for a large pro protest. A letter writing campaign bombarded uh, local officials, a veteran, uh, local political lobbyists stepped in and city officials began tamping down on the dispute. The raid revealed the deep political connections of Care by Design, reports stat, state. Sonoma County District Attorney Jill Re Revich came out Thursday in support of medical cannabis production and stated, uh, my focus at this time is to determine whether any laws have been violated which would endanger public safety on the or the environment. Hunter was released within 48 hours. The raid amounts to a 100 officer code enforcement action and care by design promising to make several operational adjustments to comply with local industrial codes. Care by Design extracts cannabis oil from raw plants matter using a pressurized uh, carbon dioxide, not flammable chemicals like butane, the company stated. The CBD guide uh, guild uh, has tens of thousands of patients uh, statewide and is the is in the process of obtaining a local permit for a large commercial facility. Just amazing. And uh, I, I love how, like I said, the police had to stand there like in a circle jerk. The DEA had to stand there, oh, this is what we used to do. <laughs> oh my God, I wish I could bust people for drugs again. <laughs> They're gonna watch porno of old busts. They're gonna watch episodes of Cops and masturbate to it. Oh my God, I used to be able to get funding and money this way. <laughs> You know. Okay, so I'm going to read uh, the next story to you, which is, again, amazing. And this is two Brookings Institute uh, analysts have come out and basically said that the boogeyman of big marijuana is ridiculous, especially in the United States. Now, maybe in Canada, where the Canadian government actually creates the boogeyman with their very own hands, that, yeah, 
there could be a crazy boogeyman of irradi irradiated weed and weed that's been sprayed with every pesticide. Now they're going to give it to your epileptic child. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Canada, but not America. Fuck you. We'll beat your fucking ass. We fucking hate monopolies with a passion. There is no monopoly that should exist, in my opinion. Ever. Not even humankind. No monopolies. Uh, we already got, like, Ma Bell and the stupid cable companies, and we would like to choke them to death, metaphorically. I mean, I'm not sure, actually. If there was some kind of revolution, I could see some cable executives getting lined up in an alleyway and, yeah. <laughs> People fucking hate monopolies in America. We, we, oh my God. It is such an affront to, to dignity and freedom. So, uh, no, it would never happen in the United States. So here, uh, they're going to explain, not only will it not happen in the United States because we don't allow it because we hate monopolies, but it won't happen because uh, it's impossible. This is after Big Tobacco's reign. Everybody's kind of like woke up to the fact that that could happen. Plus, this market has grown in a different way. It's too diverse. Marijuana is too useful. A plant tobacco, you only use for marijuana. You ain't going to make all kinds of other things. You ain't gonna make boots and sails and, you know, oil and fucking drive your car on it and build your car on it and build your house. You don't build that. Tobacco is not as useful as marijuana. Marijuana is too diverse. See, pinhead Dr. Kevin Sabat is a fucking pinhead and he is purposely misleading and trying to uh, make this argument all about just a little druggy there and a little, a little stoner. It's, just, oh, it's all about that fucking stoner and the Cheech and Chong. And we're worried about our children. He's a little fucking Grimer worm tongue. Fucking pouring poison in the king's ear and shit. <laughs> Talking in his ear and shit. Telling him fucking lies and shit. Because he works for Big Pharma. Big Pharma that loves fucking uh, smart approach marijuana and wants to see a smart approach that pays out for them because they've got a whole fucking food pyramid going on and they're on the tier that's going to get the least hassle and the most profits just like bread and other fatty fucking foods were because we were using the food pyramid to subsidize our farmers and it was not science, and it was not healthy, and it was not about healthy living or a good diet. It was about subsidizing fucking farmers. Like, the drug scheduling is about subsidizing fucking pharmaceutical companies. Like Purdue Pharmaceutical that creates fucking oxycodone and fucking Kevin Sabat indirectly fucking works for. Why and why the fuck does this asshole want to stop marijuana or curtail marijuana or restrict marijuana when he says he's all for it? I'll tell you why. Because he wants to keep the fucking prohibition thing going because he wants your kid hooked on oxy fucking coding. And your kid will get hooked on oxy coding because he can't smoke pot because they can urine test him and find out he smoked pot. So he's going to turn to the drugs that are, boom, out of his system fast or aren't tested for because those companies have got big time fucking lobbyists in Washington and they make sure nobody's going to test for that shit. So your goddamn drug war and urine tests at work and in the classroom directly led to the oxycodone epidemic and opioid epidemic that we are experiencing today, which is a fucking rerun of what the British did to the Chinese and the Chinese said to the British, fuck you and your goddamn opium. So it's been all done before. Kevin Sabas, one of them bitches. He's one of them fucking imperialist motherfucking bitches. He's trying to colonize this shit is what he's trying to do. Hmm. Not a nice person. Not worthy of the flesh he inhabits. But I believe that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And he is so much better at it than humans are. And when he takes vengeance, everyone witnesses and everyone enjoys a good laugh and goes on and 
history is satisfied, and Kevin is heading for that brick wall on a rocket sled made by NASA, and he's strapped in and ready to go. And he's going to get splattered. Trust me, he's going to be famous in the history books. He's earned his place. He's a black hat bad guy like there has never been. They will talk about him in classrooms. Who he worked for. What kind of a fucking scummy fucking boogeyman this shit was. He worked for pharmaceutical companies. Most of the guys that are ahead of Sam are ex-fucking opioid addicts. They're not trying to help you. <laughs> Oh my god, people are so stupid. They've been stupid for too long. Thank god they're waking up. They note that the marijuana industry features a staggeringly diverse array of businesses, faces, and a policy uh, environment that has been informed and shaped by the country's bitter experience with tobacco and will be subject to intense scrutiny as it fights to overcome a long history of stigma and, commercial and criminalization. For all of those reasons, they say, the prospect of giant marijuana corporations running amok as giant tobacco companies once did seems far-fetched. Huddick and Roach also point out that uh, cooperation has its benefits, including professionalism, durability, accountability, easier regulatory compliance, product consistency, and a strong interest in maintaining hard-won reputations. The best regulation is the one that doesn't need to be imposed, they write, because reputational accountability on market pressures solves the problem first. An ob observation that seems designed to make Sam, uh, president, uh, Sam's president Kevin Sabat's head explode. Kevin's an imbecile anyway. There is a downside to the ability of big companies to comply with complex and demanding rules. They can use regula regulations to put smaller businesses at a uh, competitive disadvantage, as Alteria, former, uh, formerly known as Philip Morris, did when the it supported the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, which gave the Food and Drug Administration authority over tobacco products. Because of that tendency, Roach and Willich say Sabat and his allies are wrong to uh, equate corpora corporatization with under-regulation. It is a mistake to see big companies as reliable opponents of regulation, they write. At least as commonly, they lobby for regulation to sue, sue up markets and uh, collect income uh, rents. At least as commonly. Hmm. In a separate paper that applies public choice analysis to marijuana prohibition and legalization, Roach and Philip Wolch, another Brookings senior fellow, argued that regulatory capture is less of a danger than needlessly complex and self-contradictory rules resulting from a conflicting demand of various special interests among the lines of the U.S. tax code. Though we do not dismiss the risk of regulatory capture, they say, we think the risk of regulatory incoherence are greater. In a world of norms as opposed to disrupted marijuana politics. Overregulation and misregulation uh, are at least as likely to be problems as is underregulation. Roach and Wallach note that federalism can help guard against that outcome, allowing a, diver a diversity of approaches and limiting the spread of bad policies. There is little reason why the entire country should live with a single policy when community preferences are so diverse. They say limiting regulatory purview to indiv individual states act acts as a firewall against the spread of interest groups, dep uh, depredation, and bureaucratic overreaction across multiple states, uh, panicky, uh, regulatory overkill, and an 
uh, egregious rent grab in one state needs not reach others. At the same time, a dis decentralized regulatory system allows uh, imitation of policies that turn out well. The classic laboratories of democracy arguments apply well here. Roach and Wallach write, legalizers may want to think twice before wishing for a quick move towards a national marijuana policy. Indeed, the best national policy may be the one already proposed by several Democrats and Republicans in Congress. Allow the states to have their own dis distinct policies with federal intervention only on the edges to serve core federal interests. I'm telling you, man. Boom, stoned off this shit. <laughs> Boom, stoned off this key. So happy. I'm growing weed. <laughs> now, of course, the story that I reported yesterday about the uh, supposed August 1st announcement from the DEA of rescheduling marijuana to schedule two blah blah blippity blue which basically means that they're going to move down marijuana to the baseline where all the other oxycodone and opioid drugs are that that they're making tons of money off and then you're going to see those drugs sit there and go fucking marijuana because they're all going to be sitting on the same bench see so then, then you're going to see some shit because oxycodone and stuff is that, you know, you're going to be able to make a direct comparison between the two and that's exactly what they don't want. So expect those companies to act some more asshole-ish. You know, probably they are going to have to go after them criminally because it's probably the only way to really get them to cool their jets and show them, show them we're serious about this and we will stomp your nuts into oblivion if you keep the shit up. If you keep this shit up, there, oh, honey, we will stomp your dick flat, okay? Because we see what you're doing, it's pissing us the fuck off. That, uh, you know, this is the same, like I said, shit that uh, the British did to China to try to hobble their populace, get them fucking addicted to opium. Until finally the Chinese figured it out and said, fuck your opium. They've tried shit like this in the ghetto with, I don't know, steel reserve, 40 ounces, beer, fucking menthols, and all kinds of other stuff that they've tried to fucking move into these neighborhoods and shit like that and hurt these communities. And then they spin around and they go, no, don't. Don't move a dispensary into a poor neighborhood. That'll hurt the community. Bullshit. Suddenly, people will stop having medical problems, cancer patients will start being able to cure a little bit better, and fucking kids will be able to not have seizures and shit, and you could actually undo some of the damage that's been done to them because of bad water and poor area that they live in and bad sanitation and all these kind of things. Some of this damage can be fought back with a healthy regimen of hemp, marijuana, something like this. CBD, who knows? Okay? But then these bitches uh, on the pharmaceutical companies, all these motherfuckers, they come in and they start going, oh, no, you don't want this to be like alcohol. No, bitch, this ain't nothing like alcohol. And that's the fucking point of this entire fucking thing. You dicked up big time when you made this illegal. When you started this drug war, you just didn't fuck over Americans. You just didn't fuck over poor communities and people of color. You just didn't know fuck science in the ass like there was no tomorrow. You didn't just lie to everybody and know in the 70s that it could stop cancer or help cancer. You didn't give a fuck about any of that. You did something worse. You took a plant off of the planet that can pull radiation out of the ground and fucking CO2 out of the air, motherfucker. And you endangered the entire goddamn planet like you have with your goddamn clear cutting of rainforests and every goddamn other thing you've been doing since the 70s when we started screaming about it. Understand. If this threatens our lives, we're going to destroy you. You won't escape. There will be no tomorrow for you. And if you doom the planet and the populace with your stupid fucking whatever it is you think up of in government, we will avenge ourselves on you before it's over. 
and that vengeance will be epic. And no one will cry a tear. People in this country would love to see banks dragged behind a truck. No one would cry a tear if somebody built a bonfire and tied bankers to a stake. Not one American. I'm serious. You fucked up big time. You don't fix this, it's going to hurt you bad in ways I can't even imagine. I can't even fathom. But I've seen happen in other countries. When they dick up, their populace blows up, country goes to shit. Next thing, it's in civil war for a thousand years. Dick up here, see what happens. Because that's what's happened. You, you fucked up at the beginning of prohibition. You fucked up choosing oil over the fucking plastics and fuel and oil you could have got out of a plant. You fucked up when you didn't see this as a natural factory. You fucked up when you kept thinking that your fucking human brain was so much better than nature. You fucked up. And until you straighten that shit out, you're going to be on the road to disaster. That's what. A president that's going to step up to that and say, yeah, you know what? We've been fucking up and we need to straighten it out. That one gets my respect. Everybody else, uh, whatever. You're just another fucking politician to me. And when it comes time to put you, tie you to the stake, it's going to happen, son. I don't like you. You're not my friend. You're not here to help me. I got to hurt you to get anything out of you. Like an animal that I ride. And it pisses me off. It shouldn't be like this. You do this with your behavior, taking money from lobbyists and shit that you shouldn't be taking from, harming Americans so you can make a profit. And your bitch going to ask, going to get away with it, but not your kids and not all the generations after. Evil people don't give a fuck about even their families. That's why Donald Trump, I don't trust him worth shit. He wants to have sex with his daughter. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but I mean, you know, anybody that is holding his daughter by the waist and has his hand so close to her crotch in a photograph, I have to say, could be a child molester. And that is a person who does not care about anyone but themselves and doesn't have feeling for anyone but themselves. And that's evil. That's what the essence of evil is, that you are not a person of your community, you're a predator. And you don't even have predator, predators as friends. You're just a lone predator. You're a complete enemy, like a vampire, to all of humanity. So you out there profiting, you've been profiting for a while, and goody for you. Game over. It's going to get harder and harder to do. And you'll find something new, and you'll be amazing, and it'll, and you'll make your money and shit, but then it, the rubber band of history will come and slap you upside the head so fucking hard and if you don't live to see it your children will but somebody's gonna pay the piper okay there's a really famous story it's called the bottle imp and it's about a demon that lives in this little bottle it's kind of it describes a market actually like uh, buying and selling things and problems with commerce okay so when this bottle first started out, it was worth a million dollars. And when you bought the bottle, you could make three wishes on the imp. But if you died with the bottle in your possession, you would go to hell. So the bottle would pass from person to person. They would make their three wishes and sell it. Now, the only drawback to all of this was you had to sell it for less than you bought it for. So eventually, the bottle whittles its price all the way down to Zippo. Now, this one dude, he bought the bottle, he got rid of it, but then something terrible happened in his life. So he had to hunt the bottle up, find it again, repurchase it, and now you had to go to foreign countries to find fucking coinage that was small enough to purchase the bottle. And when he got it, it looked like he couldn't sell it to anyone, and he would be stuck with it. Right? I think he was saving his girlfriend from leprosy in Hawaii or something. He was Hawaiian. Eventually, at the end, he found a derelict old sailor who had committed many sins in his life, and he sold the bottle to him because the man had nothing left to lose. And at least he could make three wishes because he was going to hell anyway. 
Problems like this are like the bottle imp. Sure, you could pass it off, but somebody's going to pay because it exists, because you created it and you profit off of it. And many people may profit off of it before it finally takes somebody, but someone's going to pay that price and all of it for every sin committed before, even if it didn't have anything to do with the person that finally ends up with that fucking bottle. That's what happens when you choose to do something that is a bad fucking idea. It just, you know, like these police being able to pull people over and do whatever the fuck they want and do an illegal search. And if you find something, you win. Okay? This is going to sucker them into doing something stupid and they're going to end up with the fucking bottle limp and they can't unload it. Sure, you get your three wishes. Consequences shall be disastrous, though. And certainly not worth the three wishes in the long run. And you won't profit off of it. Or your children won't. Or their children. But somewhere down the line, somebody's going to pay. That's the problem. We used to do a lot of things because we thought it was a good idea. Slavery, racism, dragging women by their hair into your cave to be your wife. <laughs> Once upon a time, we all thought this was an amazing way to survive a difficult situation. But over the years, we found that there are things that come, problems that occur because we made these choices. And these problems could be your wife waiting till you fall asleep and bashing your head in with a rock. Or, <laughs> or the slaves revolt and kill everyone and burn the, the plantation to the ground and escape and join the militia that is now going to make war on the county, state, and government that you once supported. Okay. Oh, here. Here's a good one. I love this one. There's a Johnny Depp movie, uh, uh, Dead Man, right? He goes to a western town in the middle of nowhere. He's uh, applying for a job he's been told he would get. When he gets there, the guy tells him, fuck you, there's no job. Right? It's like this, he's like a, a big corporation guy in this small town at the end of a rail line in the middle of nowhere. Johnny Depp, with nothing better to do, runs into a pretty girl, has sex with her. A guy comes in the room. He's going to, he's, he's pissed. You're having sex with my girl. Johnny Depp and the girl get shot. Johnny Depp shoots the guy. Guy turns out to be the dude's son that turned down Johnny Depp for the job. thereby destroying everything that that man had worked for, which was going to happen anyway because his son was an ass. But basically, through their own behavior, they created these circumstances for their own demise. And yes, they hunted Johnny Depp to the end of the movie and he died. But the point is that the old freaking creepy man that had this big corporation at the end of the, the a rail line took a nobody that he had no fear of and turned him into somebody that could destroy his very prodigy. See what I'm saying? So the minute people, and people do it by accident, and that's forgivable, but considering how terribly horrible the, the consequences are of making choices like this, I don't know why people do it. Expedience? Desperation? I can't believe that we just didn't have any other choice. You always have other choices. I have to think that's a lack of creativity right there. Why choose to do something that in the end will be either self-destructive to you or everything that you built and make it, render it meaningless? Do you know how many people I worked with for 25 years in the education system some of them didn't believe in prohibition. Some of them did, but they put many hours into Red Ribbon Week and all of these other types of activities, which now turn out to be things that pharmaceutical companies wanted us to do because nobody's telling you not to take their fucking drugs. They're just telling you not to take illegal drugs. And you notice that nobody ever brought up legal ones. 
which were way more dangerous. And I watched a ton of people engage themselves professionally with their very honor in this behavior, and I got to wonder how they feel now. Are they going to realize how much they played into a lot of this disaster? Are they going to feel any ownership for this? I doubt it. And yet there it is. Inescapable. Even good people got fucked on this deal. Must be mystery caller again. It's mystery date. Mystery date. <sighs> Telephones. Why do we have them still? They've turned into nothing but advertising. They're hoping I pick up the phone, and if they do, then a telemarketer will appear. The last one I got was a horrific sound of echoey voices somewhere in hell. A hell of a room that is filled with people, and you can hear them all talking. Blah, 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 blah. And then there's a guy. Hello? Hello? I don't want to talk to you. That sounds scary. <laughs> sounds fucking frightening. I mean, really, how good a business is whatever you're going to tell me about going to be if the I hear a million people in the background probably selling the same kind of shit, you know? Okay. That's a side note. So I'll let you go on the idea of, uh, look what we've just been through. Look at what Canada's going through with legalization. Look at how, yes, over-regulation and uh, giving police too much power really leads to the exact opposite in the end. That everything these people put their energy into, including Sam and Kevin Sabat, ends up going into nothing. Sawdust. I mean, all of that time, all of that energy, all that money, and in the end, you're going to come out with nothing but a bad reputation. And, and it's it's there for everyone to see that it's going to happen long before it starts. But why, I don't know why it is everything's got to play out like this. It's like, it, I'm not sure we are intelligent enough sometimes <laughs> to rule the universe or this part of the galaxy before the entire slow motion explosion that is the universe is over, you know. Yeah, you ever think of that? We're trapped in a slow motion explosion hurtling of stars and material that are hurtling out into space and once they were dust and nothing and they've actually congealed into planets and stuff but the hurtling and spreading apart keeps on going we're just like tiny little atom sized beings inside of a huge nuclear explosion and to us it's an eternity but probably somewhere else it's the blink of an eye you ever think of that I do. <laughs> We're all just trapped inside of some sort of, I would almost think it was an experiment, you know, or a momentary pocket of reality created for an experiment or a game or something, some sort of temporary existence for the purpose of, who knows? Isn't that what everybody keeps asking? They think that, I guess somehow, according to string theory, I don't really understand it all, but they think that our gravity actually comes from a nearby reality uh, that we could probably never access. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Maybe we are accessing. <laughs> Maybe we're actually from this other reality because I've always kind of felt like our bodies are we're like astronaut suits, you know, like we're floating, you know. <laughs> Even before somebody came to me t with the idea of like uh, uh, the soul and all this kind of stuff, there's a weird detachment that humans experience between their thoughts and their body, you know. I always thought, this is like my astronaut suit. <laughs> okay. Okay. So like I said, I'll leave you with these ideas and all these stories and think about what's coming, what's going to happen. I liked what um, 
uh, uh, Hanover Fist. He's apparently a big fan of mine. He's been making a lot of comments on my, um, he went back over many of my past shows. I really appreciate that because many of them have poor audio before I could figure everything out when I first started. But it's kind of neat that somebody has paid attention to what I've been doing, you know, <laughs> even though it's kind of crazy. And it's, it's, a, it's like part inspiration and part perspiration and part uh, crazy and anger and, you know, blaring and just reaching for straws in, in many ways. You know, like, I don't know, I'm just grasping because I'm instinctively doing things. Okay, so it's just interesting to think that there's somebody out there that's, that's looking at all that. And that's exactly what I intended. I knew that nobody was going to pay attention to me when this was happening. So I recorded those shows knowing that you're, some people hear me now. The majority of people are going to be going back and going, oh, well, here's this girl during the show. Oh, yeah, no, I didn't hear about that story. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, no, I understand. Oh, I remember when we had this argument. Oh, yeah, and, you know, so that you're actually seeing a historical thing, you know, that, that this is something I went through. After 30 years of prohibition, I've been a pot smoker since like the 70s, 78, 79, you know, I mean, really fucking early. Uh, well, I got to the thing about Hanover Fist because he brought up that uh, about the video I posted yesterday about the hemp flag. He said, look at how they had to go through hand making this flag. And there's a huge infrastructure there that uh, needs to be put in. And I'm like, that's exactly the point. That's a, th that whole cranking the thing and busting up the 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 um, the plant material in order to get the cordage off of the 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 plant stalk. Okay, you have to bust up the the kind of cr crumbly stuff in the middle and pull the the you know the co the coarse material off the husk of the outside of the stalk. Okay, so like that very machine that they had to build and they used by hand to crank the stock through to crush up that stuff is I think the very catalyst that started all of this prohibition because at the time oil fields and and all these guys and paper were just starting in their you know technology too now they've had a huge head start because they were able to hold hemp back they were able to help to hold hemp back as a uh, as a uh, industry right and I think that some of the things that got them nervous and got popular mechanics to say this was the new wonder industry was the invention of this very crank machine that looks ridiculous today. But before that, they had to have like these big long sticks with like, I don't know, like a kind of swingy piece of wood on it. And they'd sit there, flap, 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 flap. And I guess a swingy piece of wood would have more like centrifugal force or whatever, you know, would, so you wouldn't have to put that much energy into it but you would have to take this piece of wood and just hit the, the stocks on the ground bam 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 so they'd have like you know slaves or somebody do this bam 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 and that's how they did it before and somebody came up with the hey crank it through this these gears and smash it up that way and they're like oh, oh that's a lot better i like this much better you know it's like the wood splitting machine i saw in this one movie it was just like uh I don't know, kind of a motor that would pull the spring back and then ha lock in the wood and then chunk, cut the wood and then pull the spring back, you know, and it just uh, something like this and just kept doing it. So that kind of machine made this poor guy's life fucking much easier and he could make money splitting other people's wood because he had this machine, right? When nobody, people had to do it by hand. Okay, so Hanover Fizz was saying that this was, you know, they, ha they were making this flag by hand. I'm like, actually... That's the innovative technology I think that started this shit. Was that thing came along and scared the fuck out of all the other industries. And so they were like, we gotta find a way to make, oh, I know the marijuana thing. And that's when stoners became the reason why we can't have hemp. Which is, you know. And I also wanted to point out, uh, he's right about uh the, there's now i mean think of the technology could immediately speed us up we could have the, the entire field like process in two seconds in the in the finest quality hemp threads coming out but americans are literally starting out with homespun and which is so meaningful and to make a homespun flag in a time when every american flag that you look at you can see through in the sun if you look at the shadow you see the American flag on the ground because it's made of plastic. 
It's made of oil, okay? That's why it's clear. Why you can see it's so brilliant and shiny and glossy because you can, that's what plastic is. But a hemp flag is an entirely different, it's own homespun. It's that rough cordage, you know? It's, it's that, you know, sisal kind of feeling and people yearn for that in a world made of plastic. That's what I think. I think people loved in the 70s the idea of the back to the land movement along with the bicentennial. And they loved the whole little house in the prairie. People dressed in the fucking gunny sack dresses. I had one, Birkenstocks. Everybody loved that shit. Wanted to get back to the land thing. And uh, it kind of went its course and then went away and everybody embraced modern technology and stuff. But there is a yearning, and I can feel it, when you go to the swap meet, there's tons of things that are plastic, broken, smashed, junk, you know, once worked, stuff like this, that is laying in huge piles that looks like flotsam and jetsam that's been washing up in the surf for years, and somebody collected it, put it on a blanket at the swap meet, and now they're selling it to you for 10 cents a piece. I, when I go, I get this feeling like, where is all the wood? Where is, like, a basket? I'm looking for something that's made of a natural material. The only stuff I see is, like, made in Mexico or Peru, and they're, like, wooden slingshots, or they're toys that are wooden that Mexican kids play with, or, you know, you catch a ball in a cup, or something. It's the only fucking shit I see out there that isn't plastic. So I think there is a a yearning that is happening in people. We're being saturated with this material and we're becoming un, uh, not liking it too much. They're not a variety, you know? You can make the plastic look like a, a natural material, like pleather or something, but it isn't, you know? Oh, can't talk too long. I'm going crazy. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, you could sell that flag at a profit because honestly, Think about it. What 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 survivalist militia wouldn't want a hemp flag flying outside their fort of crazy or their 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 survival shelter or something like that? What what guy or or, or hippie wouldn't want that hemp flag? I could totally see that hemp flag selling in way more places than just one, you know. And it it was actually quite beautiful. Okay. So I think there's a, a lot more going on here with the marijuana thing, and it's going to explode way beyond medical and recreational. And we're just, we're fighting back so that, that we could get to the part where we actually talk about making flags or making hemp oil or, or from seed and not getting high from it, you know. And those different varied products will keep the market from being dominated when, by any one big corporation. And it could have very, um, uh, uh, let's, let's see, uh, extreme changing events for other, you know, uh, uh, industries that have dominated such as oil and paper. But don't you think they need to be shook up a little bit? Don't you think they've run their, their course and they're, they're kind of, they've looked, they've done all this stuff and they've done tons of damage. And I remember a time when the logging industry was huge, and now the logging industry is not so huge. So I think we really have a chance here to change our, the course of the ship away from stupid fucking things that are destroying the planet and our society and towards something that is not about profit all the goddamn time. It might actually, it's about profit, but in the right uh, way, something that is um, renewable, not something that, like that one. Uh, thing was saying with the hemp flag where it takes and never gives back where it's actually raping the land and then they drive away that's colonialism I'm going to take everything from here and leave you and your poor ass sitting there with nothing and a scarred earth to boot West Virginians been dealing with that shit for fucking years you know what I'm talking about that's why my people left is fuck that you know we're going to go find a better place to fucking live. We weren't always West Virginians. We were Scottish. <laughs> hey, something goes sour, you keep moving, man. Next thing you know, Davis is a popular name all over the world when it used to be Davidson in Scotland. 
So there you go. You know. I was super rambly today. But like I said, I'm distracted. I have a project I want to get to. I had a lot of thoughts about the subject that it's not just about marijuana or pot smoking or whether you want to get high. We even got into an interesting debate about that, which I'll, okay, I'll touch on it briefly. Uh, is using marijuana to get high a weakness? Does it mean you're weak of character? Or is it like every other human endeavor, part of an adventure, part of the human need to explore? even on the inside of our skulls. And I think that's something that society does not get, is that our experience as humans is both inward, okay, and outward. And many of us ignore what's happening inward. And I know that when I was a kid and using LSD or shrooms or something like that, I really felt I was sort of a, 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 a an astronaut that I was exploring my inward self. And I discovered a lot of fascinating things about myself that helped me years later to, to see myself not, not like I was a person looking out, but that I was a person who understood I was a person looking out. You know, I, that it was in, I'm looking at myself from the outside and from the inside, instead of just like through the, uh, through the eyes, like they're windows, you know? that I can look back and see inside of myself and see what's going on and be aware of it and be aware of what's going on outside, I think is an amazingly important part of the human experience. A lot of primitive peoples used to do this probably in a very dangerous way, <laughs> but I think that it's wrong for science and health and doctors to not think that maybe sometimes these experiences aren't so negative that they're actually very positive and they're sure, certainly got to be more positive than fucking shock treatment yeah. <laughs> i only took shrooms i didn't fucking take no fucking like you know car battery to the head or something <laughs> i don't think i did much better <laughs> Okay, that's enough bullshit. We've been high, sitting here. Notice how energetic, very sativa. I, I definitely feel the sativa in this weed. So I'm definitely great. These are sativa. I don't know what that, I thought maybe one of them was indica, but I don't think so now. I'm an indica person. Sativa makes me talk. <laughs> Ideas just start coming out of me. Like I start thinking of three things at one time. I, I'm thinking about, do I want a wood pick guard for the stupid guitar? Do I want to find some plastic, some piece of shitty plastic to cut up on the ground trash? Cause I don't want to spend money on stuff. And then at the same time, I'm thinking, where am I going with this fucking, you know, anecdote I'm telling on this show. And then I'm thinking, you know, I got to go out and trim some more leaves and, oh, I almost got enough money to buy uh, the parts for my guitar I'm going to work on. So I've literally, in my head, sometimes there are other, not voices, but concepts and ideas that are floating back here. Yeah. <laughs> like I could see the image of the pick card sometimes. I could see like the tuners for the guitar I have to fix. I can see my guitar hanging outside drawing from paint that I just put on clear coated it just now and it looks like shit it's just a piece of junk but it's for fun you know and and so i when i'm talking to you sometimes there are these other thoughts going on <laughs> and you can tell i'm distracted that i'm like uh, uh, uh. and when i i'm smoking a sativa like bud it certainly makes me go you know like i'm thinking different things at the same time I'm not necessarily overly distracted but it's like a mom who's carrying her kid in the store and she's going, no, you can't have any candy. I have to go get the milk. Okay, so do I want this? No, I said no. Okay. Oh, hey, Jean, what's going on? <laughs> Makes you a little bit scatterbrained, but it's okay. You're going to work your way through it. You're a woman. It's your job, you know. Not that this is exclusive to women, but when I have sativa, it definitely makes the effect of thinking about more than one thing a little bit uh, scatterbrain. <laughs> makes me talk 
a lot. I jump from ideas to ideas like crazy. And people get tired talking to me. All right, anyway, so I've said about three or four times, I'll let you go, and I'll see you tomorrow, Wednesday, and hopefully we'll have some more news on this front, and we're getting closer and closer to supposedly the DEA making some kind of an announcement, uh, even though uh, apparently the August 1st announcement is probably bullshit. <laughs> All right, so adios. You stay high, and goodbye. Gosh. I'm like so buzzy right now.